Good morning, class. I hope every, everyone is doing well out there. Today we're going to continue with our class novel, A Long Walk to Water. We're going to read chapter 10 and chapter 11. Okay, before we do that, let's talk about the reading strategy today, which is uh, right here. There we go. Find the meaning of unknown words. Use context clues. Okay, so if you don't know a word, that you are reading that can affect your comprehension. So there's a couple things you can do. Um, you can read the sentence and try to guess based on the sentence what that word means. Often you can figure out the meaning of the word just by reading the sentence and, and, and making a guess. If that does not work, you, you have options for you. You can go onto the internet and you can uh, go onto vocabulary.com and look up the definition if you need to. Um, or maybe if you have a dictionary, you can do that. Okay. So, um, really trying to understand the words that, that are unknown to you, it's important for your comprehension. So let's begin. We're going to start with chapter 11. Southern Sudan, 2008. After the two men left the village, the task of clearing more of the land between the trees began. It was very hard work. The smaller trees and bushes had to be burned or uprooted. The long grass had to be sifted and hoed under. It was dangerous work, too, as poisonous snakes and scorpions hid in the grass. Naya was still making the two daily trips to the pond. Each time she returned, she could see that slowly but surely the patch of cleared earth was growing larger. The earth was dry and rock hard. Naya felt puzzled and doubtful. How could there be water in such a place? And when she asked Depp that question, he shook his head. She could see the doubt in his eyes, too. Southern Sudan and Ethiopia, 1985. They buried Uncle in a hole about two feet deep. A hole that had already been made by some kind of animal. Out of respect for him, the group walked no more that day, but took time to mourn the man that had been their leader. Salva was too numb to think, and when thoughts did come to him, they seemed silly. He was annoyed that they would not be able to eat after all. While the men had been looting the, the group, more birds had arrived and pecked at the roosted stork until it was nothing but bones. The time for grief was short, and the walking began again soon after dark. Despite the numbness in his heart, Salva was amazed to find himself walking faster and more boldly than he had before. Marial was gone. Uncle was gone too, murdered by those New York men right before Salva's eyes. Marial and Uncle were no longer by his side, and they never would be again. But Salva knew that both of them would have wanted him to survive, to finish the trip, and to reach Utang refugee camp safely. It was almost as if they had left their strength with him to help him on his journey. He could not think of any other explanation for the way he felt, but there was no doubt. Beneath his terrible sadness, he felt stronger. Now that Salva was without Uncle's care and protection, the group's attitude towards him changed. Once again, they grumbled that he was too young and small, that he might slow them down or start crying again, as he had in the desert. No one shared anything with him, neither food nor company. Uncle had always shared the animals and birds he shot with everyone in the group, but it seemed they had forgotten that. Salva had to beg for scraps, which were given grudgingly. The way they were treating him made Salva feel stronger still. There is no one left to help me. They think I am weak and useless. Salva lifted his head proudly. They are wrong, and I will prove it. Salva had never before seen so many people in one place at the same time. How could there be this many people in the world? More than hundreds, more than thousands, thousands upon thousands. People in lines and masses and clumps. People milling around, standing, sitting, or crouching on the ground. Laying down with their legs curled up because there was not enough room to stretch out. The refugee camp at Itan was filled with people of all ages, men, women, girls, small children, but most of the refugees were boys and young men who had run away from their villages when the war came. 
They had run because they were in double danger, from the war itself and from the armies of both sides. Young men and sometimes even boys were often forced to fight, which was why their families and communities, including Saul of his schoolmaster, had sent the boys running into the bush at the first sign of fighting. Children who arrived at the refugee camp without their families were grouped together, so Salva was separated at once from the people he had, had traveled with. Even though they had not been kind to him, at least he had known them. Now, among strangers, once again, he felt uncertain and maybe even afraid. As he walked through the camp with several other boys, Salva glanced at every face he passed. Uncle had said that no one knew where his family was for certain. So wasn't there at least a chance that they might be here in the camp? Salva looked around at the masses of people stretched out far, as far as he could see. He felt his heart sink a little, but he clenched his hands into fists and made himself a promise. If they are here, I will find them. After so many weeks of walking, Salva found it strange to be staying in one place. During that long, terrible trek, finding a safe place to stop and stay for a while had been desperately important. But now that he was at the camp, he felt restless, almost as if he should begin walking again. The camp was safe from the war. There were no men with guns or machetes, no planes with bombs overhead. On the evening of his first day, Salva was given a bowl of maize to eat, and another one the next morning. Already things were better here than they had been during the journey. During the afternoon of the second day, Salva picked his way slowly through the crowds. Eventually he found himself standing near the gate that was the main entrance to the camp, watching the new arrivals enter. It did not seem as if the camp could possibly hold any more, but still they kept coming. Long lines of people, some emaciated, some hurt or sick, all exhausted. As Salva scanned the faces, a flash of orange caught his eye. Orange! An orange headscarf! He began pushing and stumbling past people. Someone spoke to him angrily, but he did not stop to excuse himself. He could see the vivid spot of orange. Yes, it was a headscarf. The woman's back was to him. But she was tall, like his mother. He had to catch up. There were too many people in the way. A half-sob broke free from Salva's lips. He mustn't lose track of her. Okay, chapter 12. Southern Sudan, 2009. An iron giraffe. A red giraffe that made very loud noises. The giraffe was a tall drill that had been brought to the village by the two men who had visited earlier. They had returned with a crew of ten or more people and two trucks, one hauling the giraffe drill along with another mysterious equipment, and the other loaded with plastic pipe. Meanwhile, the land was still being cleared. Salva's mother tied the baby on her back and walked with several other people to a place between the village and the pond. They collected piles of rocks and stones and tied them up into bundles using sturdy cloth. They balanced the bundles on their heads, walked back to the drilling site, and emptied the rocks onto the ground. Other villagers, using tools borrowed from the visitors, pounded the rocks to break them into gravel. Many loads of gravel would be needed. Naya didn't know why. The piles of gravel grew larger each day. The clangor of machinery and hammer greeted Naya each day she returned from the pond. Unfamiliar noises that mingled with the voices of men shouting and women singing. It was the sound of people working hard together. But it did not sound at all like water. Etong Refugee Camp, Ethiopia, 1985. Mother, mother, please! Salva opened his mouth to call out again, but the words did not come. Instead, he closed his mouth, lowered his head, and turned away. The woman in the orange headscarf was not his mother. He knew this for certain, even though she was still far away, and he had not seen her face. Uncle's words came back to him. The village of Lun Arik was attacked, burned. Few people survived. 
No one knows where they are now. In the moment before calling out to the woman a second time, Salva realized what Uncle had truly meant, something Salva had known in his heart for a long time. His family was gone. They had been killed by bullets or bombs, starvation or sickness. It did not matter how. What mattered was that Salva was on his own now. He felt as though he were standing on the edge of a giant hole, a hole filled with the black despair of nothingness. I am alone now. I am all that is left of my family. His father, who had sent Salva to school, brought him treats like mangoes, trusted him to take care of the herd. His mother, always ready with food and milk and a soft hand to stroke Salva's head. His brothers and sisters, whom he had laughed with and played and looked after, he would never see them again. How can I go on without them? But how can I not go on? They would want me to survive, to grow up and to make something of my life, to honor their memories. What was it Uncle had said during that first terrible day in the desert? Do you see that group of bushes? You need only to walk as far as those bushes. Uncle had helped him get through the desert that way, bit by bit, one step at a time. Perhaps, perhaps Salva could get through life at the camp in the same way. I need only to get through the rest of this day, he told himself. This day and no other. If someone had told Salva that he, he would live in the camp for six years, he would have never believed it. Six years later, July 1991. They are going to close the camp. Everyone will have to leave. That's impossible. Where will we go? That's what they're saying. Not just this camp, all of them. The rumors skittered around the camp. Everyone was uneasy. As the days went by, the uneasiness grew into fear. Salva was almost 17 years old now. A young man. He tried to learn what he could about the rumors by talking to the aid workers in the camp. They told him that the Ethiopian government was near collapse. The refugee camp was run by foreign aid groups, but it was the government that permitted them to operate. If the government fell, what would the new rulers do about the camps? When the question was answered, no one was ready. One rainy morning, as Salva walked towards the school tent, long lines of trucks were arriving. Masses of armed soldiers poured out of the trucks and ordered everyone to leave. The orders were not just to leave the camp, but to leave Ethiopia. Immediately, there was chaos. It was as if the people ceased to be people and instead became an enormous herd of panicked, stampeding, two-legged creatures. Salva was caught in the surge. His feet barely touched the ground as he was swept along by the crowd of thousands of people running and screaming. The rain, which was falling in torrents, added to the uproar. The soldiers fired their guns into the air and chased the people away from the camp. But once they were beyond the area surrounding the camp, the soldiers continued to drive them onward, shouting and shooting. As he dashed ahead, Salva heard snatches of talk. The river! They're chasing us towards the river. Salva knew which river they meant. The Gilo River, which was along the border between Ethiopia and Sudan. They are driving us back to Sudan, Salva thought. They will force us to cross the river. It was the rainy season. Swollen by the rains, the Gilo's current would be merciless. The Gilo was well known for something else, too. Crocodiles. That's the end of the chapter. Thanks for listening. I will see everybody next class.